going to uh, continue with uh, what we were talking about last week. We, last week we were talking about standing strong in an individual storm, right? When adversity comes at us individually, how do we handle that? And what does the Bible tell us about the best way of handling that situation? And we talked about, one, knowing God, two, having conviction in the Bible, and three, coming with all of those issues in prayer. Today I'm going to take that a bit of a step further today, and we're going to talk about what do we do biblically when those adversities hit us as the body of Christ, and how do we handle those, and what is important in that situation, and how do we show support together as the body of Christ. I'd like us to first turn to Matthew 11, and we're going to be looking at verses 28 to 30 to begin, and it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Those are the words of Jesus himself. And so it's very important that as a group, as the members of the body of Christ, that our eyes are always on Jesus and the teachings of Christ and how he wants us to relate to each other in times of adversity. So what is our role? What is our Christian role inside of that body? We do know that each of us have different gifts that we bring to the body of Christ. And that each of us are called for his purpose, not for our own. And as we look at who was called, some of them, we're going to take a look at two very important ones today, about calling and how they related to the body of Christ, didn't want to initially take that call. The first one that I want to take a really good look at is Moses. Let's look um, and turn to uh, Exodus. And in fact, it was chapters 1 through 17 really, really is dedicated to Moses' ministry. And um, when we're looking at Exodus, and we're looking at Moses in general, what did Moses need to have happen for him to believe he was to have a ministry? Let's look at chapter 3. And let's start, um, let's start at verse 1 there. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, and the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses, and he, and he said, here am I. So what did it take Moses to actually move forward in his ministry? He needed a burning bush. He needed the Lord to speak to him. He had stage fright. He's probably the biggest example of stage fright that we have in the Old Testament. He was afraid to move forward in faith. He was afraid of not being able to deliver that message. He was afraid that he couldn't let God work through him until God spoke to him and he turned and said, here am I. God will choose people to use for many different reasons. He will call people in the body of Christ for many different issues. We should always support the gifts that God gives to each of us differently because we will all have the same gift. 
And those gifts then work together in unity to form us as a full body of Christ. And we're to support those gifts of each other, to lift up the entire body. <coughs> See, this is the church of Christ. We are members of the church of Christ. This isn't my church. It's not a denomination's church. It's the church of Christ. And we have to keep our eyes on Christ in church. Amen. See, we often over time have missed that church is actually the people in it. We are the body of Christ. We make up that church. Certain churches, over time, have put the organization above Christ or have put one person above Christ. We are all to be unified and keep our eyes on Christ. That's what makes up the church. When we don't keep our eyes on Christ, especially when adversity comes into the place where we are to gather together, when division comes amongst our body, then the Holy Spirit can't move amongst it. We need to be unified in belief yeah. and unified in love Amen. to one another. Amen. See, Facebook and, and these wonderful social media platforms have all taken away our unity and, and has us solely falling on self. Amen. When I stop taking pictures of others and I take a selfie, right? That's for my glory, my edification. We are getting to wanting one of these instead of knowing what we need to keep this together. We're too worried about me, 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 and I, 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 and not we, and keeping our eyes to Christ. We have to have organization. We need people to stand forth and stand up and organize the church. We need rules to follow. God gives us them in the Bible. And so, so much the church, and we must follow the rules set forth where we're in. And hopefully those rules stand on the word of God. That those rules are solely based in the word of God. That we're looking at true godly doctrine and that our prejudices or our beliefs have not somehow distorted the truth. Right. See, the word of God is where we come for everything. Yeah. For correction. For reproof. So the scriptures tell us that's our role. See, we have a commission given to us by Christ based in the scripture. We are to make disciples of the entire world. And the commandments given in the Holy Scripture is that we are to do that by loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, Amen. with all of our mind, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength, and that we are to love our neighbor as our self. But that love of neighbor has to be a selfless act. So you have to put yourself away and let the neighbor's issue be you, the love that you're portraying. What is a miraculous thing? We have armies fighting each other. And you think it's going to be a sword fight or a gun fight. A little boy comes there with a rock. A rock. And it's going to slay a giant with his faith in God. How we're going to slay giants around us is by simple faith in God, eyes on Christ. That would be David. That would be the second example in the Old Testament of where how we turn in faith to Christ. Amen. See, when we move forward in faith, when we you are we are unified and are moving forward to face adversity, we step out of the way. We are just a willing vessel for the Holy Spirit to work 
and for God to work. We have to understand that it can't be about us. It certainly isn't about me. I don't have the right answer. I never will. So we have two natures. I have a fleshly side and a spiritual side. And we have a default setting. When we panic or things become uncomfortable or we're hurt, we default into that fleshly side. We have to be unified together in the spirit. We must be walking in the spirit. And sometimes <coughs> that can be very difficult. And the other thing we are to be, and is what shines to the whole world, is that we are to set apart from the world that we are in. Let's turn to um, 2 Timothy 2.21. Take a look at that today. Leah had said 1 Timothy is a great letter. I, I devised both of them are, are excellent for reading. Um, and I especially like 2 Timothy, and I like how Paul is beautifully um, giving us understanding and direction. Here. If a man, therefore, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for his master's use, and prepared unto every good work. 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Let's keep going. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender stripes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So a lot right here. We're given a lot of direction on how we, as the group, can lift the church. See, we stand in a lot of storms today, right? There's a lot going on and moving in our world. And a lot of us, even as the body of Christ, are taking our eyes off Christ. The Bible gives us a beautiful picture of what happens when our eyes come off Christ. Peter, right? In the boat during the storm. I think we talked about this a little bit before. Think of that. A terrible storm. You're scared. You're frightened. Peter sees the Lord on the water, and he steps out of that boat in belief and completely in faith. And as his eyes are on Christ, he's walking on that water. Totally not of his own doing. He's walking because his eyes are placed on Christ. Amen. And when he takes his eyes from Christ and he realizes what is he doing, he's doing, he sinks because he leaves Christ and stands in his will. Stands in his understanding, standing in his not spiritual belief but worldly, fleshly belief, and he sinks. That's what will happen to us in a storm if we're not unified on truth. If our eyes leave Christ, we'll sink. And we can all sink if we don't do that together. And what does that mean for us as a church? What does that mean for us as a body of believers. See, during this time of the Bible, when the early church was coming around, they used to call themselves the followers of the way. I like that term. Yeah. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we can only come to the Father except through him. Amen. Therefore, we should be believers and followers of the way, the only way. That's the church we are. Amen. We have taken in adversity different titles and torn 
a part the body of Christ. You see, the body of Christ should be unified. There are no missing pieces. As believers, we don't cut out other believers. You, there is no appendix in the body of Christ, you know, those pieces that aren't needed, where you just cut them out and throw them away. We're all needed in this body. We're all needed as believers to bring forth the commission of making disciples of the entire world. And a disciple is not just bringing someone to the foot of the cross and leaving them there. We bring them there. They accept, they believe God does his work because that's God's work to do, not our own. But once we've gotten to that part, then we feed each other and we water the seeds of the fruits of the spirit that we're given so that we may grow together in Christ's church together. This whole era of social media has made it, made it very easy for us to air grievances, to cause division, to hurt each other, to make a small adversity a big one. We need to come back to what the Bible says. When we have issues with each other, come one to another first. If we cannot work that out biblically and in the Bible, then bring in the elders of the church. We know how this works. We have to rest assured on biblical doctrine, on truth. That's what's going to get us through all the adversities we have going on in our world today. The only thing to get us through when we're having problems is God. We are built to worship God. Amen. We are built to keep our eyes on Christ. And when we don't, we're going to worship something. Yeah. Something is going to fill that missing piece. You know, we talked a little bit about our you this morning. And the reason why our you works and is great, and Chris will tell you, and I will tell you, is that yes, it is you first start in that belief in Christ. That's where we have to start. That's where our salvation comes from, is through Christ. And without that basis, we can't turn from anything. But we all are sinners. And we all fall. And we'll make mistakes. And are you is beautiful because are you pulls that brother up when that fall occurs? and brings them back to the word of God and helps them regain that footing to move forward. We have to do that as a church. When our brothers and sisters fall and we need to make correction based on the word of God, we do that together. We don't compromise the word of God. We work with that brother or sister, we dig it out. We do word studies. We do um, exegesis of the actual literal meaning of what we're talking about and understand it moving forward. Our hermeneutics must be strong. We have to stand on context, on literal translation, and on grammar. And we have to know what we're talking about. And when we don't, we have to be humble and say, you know what, I don't have that answer. Let's learn it together. We have to come to each other in disagreements, in peace, like this just said. And in meekness, and in kindness, and in love. See, part of our role spiritually and in adversity is that we're in our sanctification process, right? And that process isn't a switch. It is a lifelong journey where we're becoming more, what? Christ. So we need to bring on those attributes of Christ. There are two Greek words for church. One of them is ecclesia, and the other one is keke oika. And keke oika actually means Lord's house. 
Nekrakesia means separated ones. Ones that are separated from the world. The King James uses the word church for ecclesia, which is good. We want to be separated. We want to be called out. That's what we are as the body of believers. That's the right translation right there for church. We've fallen away from that biblical truth. We need to be that called out body. That body who stands on truth of the word of God. Let's take a look at Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. important. That's part of what Christ wants us to do. To be together in unity. Right? Let's look to that. Let's look at Acts 2.42, please. This is what the early church was doing. This is why it's important we gather together. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is Christ's doctrine. That's the doctrine they learned from Christ in his presence. And fellowship, that's the gathering together, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. See, all of those things make up what we need to do inside this body. If we don't do those things together, then we will not succeed in Christ's movement for us forward in bringing others to the foot of the cross. We cannot compromise on what God wants us to do. We cannot make concessions <laughs> and bring the world into how we behave. We cannot allow our eyes to leave Christ and, our, and us to idolize something that isn't him, right? That's why we come to worship Christ, not church. Mm -hmm. Amen. The church is our home. The church is our sanctuary. The church is where we find Christ. If we don't find Christ and the Holy Spirit there, then it is not Jesus' church. That's right. Amen. We have to keep our eyes on him, on his word. Because yes. Christ is the word, right? Yes. John 1.1. 1, 1. Yeah. In the beginning, we know it, let's do it together. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. There is no compromise on that. We stand on the deity of Christ. That's what our churches need to come back to, the yeah. principles of what Christ founded. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We're not here to make each other feel good. No. The world can do that for you temporally. Mm -hmm. This is a place for us to find joy. Mm -hmm. Love. Mm -hmm. Acceptance. Yeah. Not as the world says it, 
but as God outlines it in his word. We do not devour each other here. We correct. See, we'll never condone sin. We can't because God doesn't. We don't condemn it. See, there's a difference between condemnation and condoning. When you don't condone something and you allow the Holy Spirit to do its work and the Holy Spirit convicts, then we have change. We learn that in our you too. See, condemnation is a lie. Condemnation holds that person in bondage. That's the yoke that keeps a person down. See, even God doesn't condone sin. He moves us to change. He can't be where sin is. It's not in his nature. The scriptures tell us that. So we have to stand unified, loving each other as the body of Christ. I've been troubled. I've been reading all around the internet. People who are to be brothers and sisters together that claim love for each other, that are talking about each other in ways that I have just had to pause. And I had to go back and be still and realize where God is and realize who God is and come back to the word of God. You see, how we react to each other is just as important as what we say to each other. See, we can beautifully say all the scripture that we can, all the stuff that we've memorized, but if those reactions and actions don't follow what's coming out of our mouth, are we really following God's word? If we don't react to each other as the Bible tells us to, are we really standing in that truth? So we don't get to pick and choose, right? We don't get to pluck out things. We don't get to look at certain things and say, hey, you know, this says this. Be careful. Keep reading. Because as you're reading, you may find you fit into somewhere where you're causing issue for someone else. And then that suddenly makes us lose credibility. So we can't have it all both ways that we want, right? We say too in our youth sometimes, you know, I'll sit somewhere and I have a struggle, but you're a sinner. <laughs> and I'm quick to call you the sinner, I just struggle. We are all sinners. Amen. And we all fall short Amen. of the glory of God. So how do we react to each other? Well, let's look at John 15, 12 to 3. Because Jesus calls us to a higher standard as believers. Again, John 15, 12 to 13. <clears throat> And we're looking here at the words of Christ. This is my commandment. That ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. I didn't see a lot of life laying down when I was reading those posts. I didn't see a lot of love there either. But I was lifted this week because four hostages were brought home. And one Israeli commando lost his life for that homecoming. What, what a wonderful thing, right? The Bible tells us he lost his life for his friends. What a sacrifice. See, that's a Christ-like sacrifice. 
That's what Christ did for us. Why do we have such a hard time when rough times come to shower that upon another? See, if we want to receive this unconditional love from Christ, don't we have to give it? Yeah. If we want to see someone else as a sinner, shouldn't we see ourselves in the same light? Yeah. You know, the world tells us, you know, just walk a mile in someone else's shoes, right? Yeah, I don't think I want to do that. Because <laughs> I don't want to have to give my shoes to anyone else. That would be terrible. But the miles I've walked have led me here. Amen. A body of believers such as you all have led me here. People who prayed for me. People who encouraged me. People who saw a change and said, fill in for me. I need you. I'm just humbled to be here. Because by all recollections, I shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. But that's God's work. Amen. That's Amen. God's people's work. That's what the church accomplishes when the church is unified. Glory to God. We've seen that with our own pastor. We've prayed for his healing. He's doing well. He is faithful to someone like me. So I'm faithful back in Christ, not in my own self. It's to God be the glory. Amen. See, I can't save anyone. I wish I could. I can't. Only God can. I just got to bring them here so that God can touch their heart. God can show them something else to be. And that we as the people who pray for me, who pray for them. Unified, together in love like Christ. Let's take a look at um, Luke 23, 31. <laughs> Luke 23, verse 31. If they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? What does that speak to us from Jesus? That's saying, if we're going to do that something that is living when we're flourishing, what are we going to do when the adversity comes? How are we going to handle someone when we're having issues, when the world is dry? Right? When we're flourishing and things are green, we're all moving in a good way, right? I'll tell you, this country's in the dry. How do we get back to the green? I'll tell you, we fall on our knees with humble heart and repent to Christ. Second Chronicles tells us that, right? We will fall on our knees, repent, turn from our wicked ways, and put our face towards Jesus. He will heal our land. Amen. He will heal our church. He will heal division. Amen. He will heal people from not talking about each other in ways that just make your head spin. We come together. We solve the issues together. We have come out of this world. Why are we still treating each other like we're in it? We are to be a shiny city on a hill. One where people can come broken, hurting, and know that we will bring them to the foot of the cross and allow Jesus and the Holy Spirit to heal them. And we will come not from where we stand, but we will get down and we will be with them where they are. Yes. And we will show them and guide them from where they are to where we are now. And how that works with the word of God. 
and we will stop calling each other names. We will stop referring to each other in that way. Because would Jesus talk to us that way? I mean, I talk about this a lot too, the woman at the well. It's my favorite. Right? He could have called her many names, couldn't he have? He could have accused her of many things, but he convicted her with the truth. And he handled her so lovingly that she knew who she was. You see, God's not on a throne in his place with a hammer in his hand, ready to have believers come and hit them over the head. When we come into the presence of God, the hammer is going to be in our hand. We're the one with the hammer every time we fall at the foot of the cross. We're the one who have sinned and fall with that hammer. See, the beauty is when we come into heaven, the only person that's ever going to have scars there, that's ever going to be unperfect, because you'll be perfect, is the one welcoming you, wrapping his arms around you with nails in his hands. Amen. The ones we get. So we have a responsibility to bring others to God lovingly, as Christ would, in truth, in the word of God, and humbly, so that when we don't know, or we are not sure, we seek that together, as we would as a family. Because, see, we're never all going to get along. We're never all going to agree 100% of the time. But we all have to be humbled enough to sit down and work it out together and let God speak. Let God speak through his word. And step out of the way of ourself. Let's take a look at Ephesians 4.32. And it says, Ephesians 4, 32, And ye be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. It's powerful, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But we all stand there and know what we want to receive from Christ. Right? And that goes back to that struggle, right? We would just struggle, right? That's the one time when I stand there and say, okay, I'm a, I am a sinner. Take it. Take it away. And he does, unquestionably upon our belief. Mm -hmm. And he justifies us and he regenerates us. And then we get to move forward in our sanctification and become more like him. Hallelujah. Well, that becoming more like him, we better forgive like him. When we sit in these pews and understand who we are now, we better know who we are today. Let's go there, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, now what do we do when there's a therefore? We ask what? The therefore is there for. And what does that tell us? That's always telling us that Paul is moving out of theology and into application. Okay? <laughs> so this is application. And it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That person you used to be upon belief is over. Yeah. He's washed you white. He has forgiven you. Stand in that truth. Yeah. 
Don't act like you used to be. Yeah. Know that you're new. But us as a church has to treat you as new. Yeah. We have to see you as new. We have to cultivate those fruits of the Spirit as if you're new. I've seen a lot of past flying at members of the body of Christ universally. I have this week have witnessed church, church leaders and elders and, and, and members calling people goofballs and other kinds of things. Those are not things we call each other. If we have issues, come to the word of God. When we're in a storm and there's adversity, turn to the word of God. Forgive. Be Christ-like. Because then we won't sink. When our eyes are on Christ, we can do all things. Just a mantra I had to repeat to myself over and over again. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Does that mean I'm doing all things through Christ who strengthens me as Christ would want me to do them? No, but I stop. And I say it, and wow. Wow don't do it because I've taken my eyes off myself and put my eyes back on Christ Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> see we are the body of Christ and I want to leave us with a thought today I'm going to kind of leave us with this notion of we often talk about kingdom business right what does that mean what's kingdom business that means our eyes are on Christ. Our eyes are on the world to come. Our eyes are on his kingdom. See, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. That brings us back to being ecclesia. That brings us back to being called out. Are we acting that way? See, it's not just good to know it. We don't just read it. We have to believe it, and we must live it. Yeah. For how we treat each other and the actions we put forth are so much stronger than the words that come out of our mouth. Because if we're saying one thing and doing another, let's check ourselves, right? Let's understand that we have to stop with the me, 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 me and start putting what we want to take into ourselves and reflecting it to the others that are around us. See, there's a rippling effect of things that we do. Amen. I'll share one rippling effect that touched me greatly. Most of you know this story, and I won't be shy about it, because it's part of my testimony. I went through a very selfish period where it was all me. I was in the flesh, bucking in the flesh all the time. And then I felt and realized that God was convicting me and I didn't like what the flesh <coughs> wanted anymore. But still being fleshly, I thought, I can just step out of this. Let's just end it, right? Well, God interceded in many ways. One, he didn't allow the event to happen. But two, someone very close to me sent a picture after they finally found me because I had driven miles away. A picture of my mom crying and I realized the rippling effect of what my selfishness was doing to everyone around me that's the conviction that Jesus gives you that changes life Amen. <laughs> people praying that moved the Holy Spirit to speak to me me when I stood in my own self-hatred in my own condemnation, thinking it was being poured on me because I was too worldly when I should have been in the word of God. Amen. Yeah. When I should have fallen on my knees and cried out, because when I finally did, Romans 10, 13 is true. For all who cry in the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. This is truth. It happens. We need to share those stories with each other. We need to stop being so embarrassed by what people may think of who we were before yeah. that they can see the before and after. Yeah. Amen. 
I'm a new creation. I'm something different. So are all of you, and that's what's beautiful. So let's celebrate that with each other. So how do we get through these storms? Let's wrap it all up and tie it up with a pretty bow, right? Because we need direction. First, where is our foundation? What are we building on? What's upon the rock of this church? Jesus Christ. That's where we start our building. On that foundation. And then we continue up in the word of God. That's the next layer of the building, right? And upon a word of God, we get to know God intimately through his word. And we have to take that intimate relationship with him. See, our love of Christ is an intimate, personal relationship. See, the church isn't a business. The church isn't truly an organization. The church is a (coughs) relationship with Christ and with each other. So we need to start building relationships based on our intimate knowledge of Christ and the word of God built upon the foundation of Christ. And then, of course, we get to build another layer on his salvation that he provides to us. That gift of eternal life because of what he gave (coughs) unselfishly and graciously that day on the cross. See, I can't save you. The church can't save you. Only Jesus Christ can save you. Through that belief in him as your savior. There is no other way. That's why I like the way. That's the way. We have lost who we are. Let's come back. Because Christ wants us back. So what, what do we build with? Now that we have a foundation and these storms come, what do we build with? We build with obedience to the word of God. Not obedience to Sean's feelings or anyone else's, but to the word of God. And may us, be, may us each be humble enough to be healed by the word of God. Amen. This is to heal. I've seen a lot of it used as a weapon lately. And then people using it as a weapon wrongly and that not wanting to stand down and hear what the word has to say and humble them to a soft, forgiving, and loving Christ-like heart. You see, what the heart says is truly what you believe. We have to also stand in the truth that we have a never-forsaking Savior. What does that mean? I'm sorry, I'm going to forsake you guys. And human, right? We're all going to have those moments of weakness. But let us stand in what Jesus provides to us and let us emulate that. He will never forsake you or leave you. Amen. When everyone around you, else around you, has fallen away, come to Christ. Amen. Last verse in closing. Ephesians 3.20. Sorry, I went a little long today, but. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be the glory in the church. Let's repeat that. Undo him, be the glory in the church, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. We must glorify God at all times. No matter what storm is coming through our life, we need to stand on the resurrection of Christ. And know that how we're doing this and putting together this church, he's coming back for it. And we need to be prepared. We need to be built upon these things, the rock of Jesus Christ. And then love one another. 
We're commanded to do so. We haven't done a good job there. Forgiveness is part of love. In fact, forgiveness is the greatest expression of love. That's divine. I know God's given it to me. I want to give it forth now to you. Unconditionally. I don't use it when it suits me. I use it all the way. <coughs> See, a life and a church that is built this way, built upon the word, built about all of the things that we've talked about, built upon the rock of Jesus, it will not fail. The Bible tells us that. It will stand strong forever. So build it that way. Build our children that way. Build our workplaces that way. Build our church that way. And please build our nation that way. Amen. For we are one nation under God. How have we forgotten that? As a country. So I just pray that we fall on our knees. We turn from our wicked ways. And that God will heal this land and all lands, and that we can fulfill the, the commission, the great commission, of not just bringing people to Christ, but making disciples of people of Christ. See, that's a lifelong journey. We need to be in it for life. Take them in to the hospital. Let the broken and the weak and the unrighteous come, and let's let God heal them through the love that we show them as Christ would have us do standing on his truth there's no one who shouldn't be here see God doesn't lock the door and turn the light off right in fact he leaves the door open and there's a porch light on he'll knock and 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 knock answer there's nothing that you could have done that will keep you from him there's only one sin that will keep you from the glory of God, and that's blasphemy, the Holy Spirit. Let us remember that so that we can come in total and complete repentance to the foot of the cross and let ourself get out of the way and let God speak. Let's just be still for a moment and know that he is God. I'm going to take a moment of quiet so we can each examine our heart today. And no, if you, need, if you need Christ, just simply ask for that healing. This is your personal relationship with him. Take the moment and clear your heart, clear your thought. Allow God in. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We come today as the Church of Christ. We come to you today as an assembly of the body in which Christ is the head. May we always understand that. May we always know that these buildings are called sanctuaries for a reason. Not as the world would have us think of sanctuary, but what they truly are. A place where you reside. A place where the broken, the unrighteous, and those that need healing, even us as believers who need healing each and every day, will come and get that through you. May we always put you first. May we always stand on your word, the truth. May we never compromise on that word. May we never turn away from Christ. May we understand what Christian is. It is having Christ in faith. It's Christ's people. May we become more like the way. May we point people in the way. May we bring people to the way and let us step out of the way. And let the way do its work. Please, God, come and heal our land. We cry out for it. But may we come together as a unified body in your love, not condoning or standing on sin, but helping people overcome it. That's our goal, to love people to Christ as you have loved us to yourself. May we forgive as you. May we dive deeper into the word as you'd like us to. May it convict us. May we not only read it, that we might only memorize it, may we not only understand it, but may we 
live it so that we can come back to being that shining city on the hill. And I pray today in Christ's name, amen.